بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين أما بعد السلام عليكم to everyone let's make a start إن شاء الله so last week we were we were speaking about the lineage of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم so we spent quite a, you know a fair amount of time talking about the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Ismail and then we touched on some of the lives of the other prophets and then we spoke about how Sayyidina Ismail was born in the in in the Hijaz and how his family ended up there and how that they had he had intermarried into the tribe known as the Jurham and then we paused on the Jurham and then we went to the lineage so today what i want to do is I want to speak a bit more about the lineage, but I want to tie it back. I want to kind of go full circle and connect it back to the Jurhum because the Jurhum are significant. And, and we'll see hopefully through the course of uh, today's lesson how. Now, I, I don't want to go through all the particulars of each of the, 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 the members of the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu But I, I do want to start with uh, Abd Manaf. Just, just a quick um, a recap. Um, so... Abd Manaf, he was, his name is uh, Mughira. His actual name is Mughira. He was the son of Qusay. So those of you who, who missed this, so if you're just tuning in this week, then it's worth catching up on last week's lesson where I, di- I did go through who each of the, um, the, 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 the people in the lineage of the Prophet were. So I mentioned all the names all the way up to the, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all the way back to, to Adnan. Um, so Abd Manaf, he was the son of uh, Qusay, and his actual name was Mughira. And Mughira, or Abd Manaf, he had four children. He had four children. He, he had, according to Ibn Ishaq, who is the one of the earliest uh, and most detailed biographers of the, of the Prophet. He says four children. However, Ibn Hisham and others have mentioned a number of other children, but I'll just stick with that for now. He had, um, those four children were through two wives. The first, her name was Atika bint Murra. So the first of his wives was Atika bint Murra, Atika. And she, he had three children through her. One was Hashim. So Hashim ibn Abd Manaf. She also gave him Abd Shams and she gave him Muttalib. So three children through Atika, Hashim, Abd Shams and Muttalib. And the other wife was Waqida, Waqida bint Amr, Waqida bint Amr, and she gave him Nawfal. So there were four children, all four, these, uh, all, all four were boys that Ibn Haq mentions. Hashim, Abd Shams, and Muttalib through uh, Atika, and Nawfal through Waqida. Sayyidina Hashim, so one of the three children uh, that he had through Atika, uh, was to be the grand, the great grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu and Hashim himself had um, he had a number of wives, um, and he had a, you know a number of children of which two of them through Selma bint Amr. So two of them through Selma bint Amr were Ruqayya, one of his daughters, and Abdul Muttalib. So he had uh, Abdul Muttalib and Ruqayya through Selma bint Amr. And the other children that I mentioned, again, I think uh, uh, um, Ibn Hisham mentioned a few more than uh, Ibn Hisaq, but amongst them were Asad, Abu Saifi, uh, uh, Shifa, Khalida, Da'ifa, Hayya, uh, a number of other uh, children that I mentioned of uh, Hashim through other wives. But the two that came through Salma bint Amr was Abdul Muttalib and Ruqayya. And as I said, Abdul Muttalib was to become the, would, would, would be the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abdul Muttalib had 10 boys and he had six, six girls. Five of his children came through one wife. They were Abbas. So Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. So you had Abbas, you have Dirar, you have Hamza, you have Al-Muqawwim. That's, yes, yeah, so that's the five through. Uh, that, so you had Ab- Al-Abbas, Dirar, Hamza, uh, Al-Muqawwim, and Hajal. These five were the uh, children through one wife. And then he had Samra bint, uh, um, sorry, he had Al-Harith, who was... Um, who was through Samra bint Jumra. 
So Samra was a mother of Al-Harith, so another of the wives of Abdul Muttalib. So, so Abbas, Dirar, Hamza, Al-Muqawwim, and Hajjal were all full, uh, full siblings, so full brother, full brothers. Um, Al-Harith would have been their half-brother, so through Samra, Samra, he had a different mother. And then you have Abu Lahab. Yeah, Abu Lahab was also one of the sons of Abdul Muttalib. Abu Lahab, his actual name was uh, Abdul Uzza. Abu Lahab's actual name was Abdul Uzza. And his mother was Lubna bint Hajar. Abu Lahab, his actual name was Abdul Uzza. And his mother was Lubna bint Hajar. So again, he wasn't a full brother of Hamza or Abdullah. And then Abdul Muttalib had one daughter through another wife, Sakhra bint Abd. So he had Safiya, Safiya through Sakhra bint Abd. And then through Fatima bint Amr, so through Fatima bint Amr, through Fatima bint Amr, he had Abdullah, who would be the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, he had Abu, uh, he had Abu Talib, who was the full uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, and Abu Talib's actual name was. Does anyone know? What was Abu Talib's actual name? He also had Zubair. He had uh, Um Hakim al Bayda. In fact, all of Abdul Muttalib's daughters, except Safiya, came through Fatima bint Amr. Yeah, all of the daughters of Abdul Muttalib. So all of the the aunties of the Prophet Sallallahu except Safiya, came through Fatima bint Amr. Who were they? They were Um Hakim al Bayda, um, Atika, um, Umayma, Arwa, and Barra. So through Fatima, we have Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib, the full uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have Zubair, who is the full uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these, some of these names should be familiar to you. And if, it's, if they're not, don't worry, because as we get into the seerah, I'm just emphasizing these names because they do come up every now and again. So where I, you know, dub, double up on the emphasis, it means that remember this name because it will come up later. His, his name was Abd Manaf. His name was Abd Manaf. Abu Talib, that is, Abu Talib's name was Abd Manaf, um, or at least that's what um, that's what Ibn Ishaq says his name was. So the daughters all but Safiya came through this Fatima bint Amr. So you have Abdullah, Abu Talib, Zubair, and then the five daughters that came through Fatima were, because um, we said he had six daughters altogether, the five came through Fatima, which who were Um Hakim al Bayda, Atika, Umayma, Arwa. And Barra. Now, Abdul Muttalib was the one who dug up the 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 um, well of Zamzam. So the bit that I've missed out, and I've done this deliberately because it requires a bit of time just to explain it. The bit that I've missed out is the Zamzam that Sayyidina uh, Ismail or Hajar had found between Safa and Marwa. Um, and we mentioned, I think we mentioned this last week, that the idols that sit upon the Safa and Marwa are, uh, there are two, two idols. We'll talk about them shortly, in fact. So there were a number of idols that were placed throughout Makkah. So as time went on and people forgot, uh, as they did in the previous generation, which is why I thought it's important to touch on uh, the, the pre, kind of the, the, the extinct Arabs, because each of them, had as time went on, they forgot their roots and they fell into idolatry and then prophets were sent to them and they, uh, um, and they were either those notion nations that destroyed or they were given that time to, to re-find God. And then where that happened, again, things kind of rectified themselves. And then with time, with the passing of time, hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, they, they went back to the same, uh, same thing again. This happened over and over and over again. And the same was true for Sayyidina Ismail Islam, because as time went on, people fell into idolatry. Yeah. So they they, led, they fell into idolatry and they the, the Quraysh, this is this is where the, where where we have this term Jahiliya. The Jahiliya came about, and this is where each of the uh the the um 
the tribes of Mecca had their own idol, which represented each tribe. Yeah. Um, and they had the largest idol was Hubal. And Hubal was placed on the top of the Kaaba. It was placed on the top of the, of the Kaaba. They had other titles like, uh, uh, titles, idols even, uh, like Isaf and Naila. Isaf and Naila were placed on the Safa and Marwa. These were smaller idols. One was placed on the Mount Saf, Safa and the other one was placed on the hill of Marwa. And these were places where they went to and they worshipped. Each of the tribes had their own uh, um, uh, idols and that was their identity and that's what they protected. That was a role that they, that they had. Um, so what happened was, Ibn Isa, I'll come on to the, the particulars as to how, how it was that the Zamzam what was, um, um, you know, came to be lost. I'll come on to that shortly, inshallah. Um, but for now, when it was in the time of Abdul Muttalib, meaning in the, the grandfather of the Prophet, وسلم, Abdul Muttalib, that he was once sleeping in the Hijr, as Ibn Ishaq narrates, he was sleeping in the Hijr, meaning by the Kaaba, and he saw a dream. And in his dream, he says, he, somebody had came to him, you know, Utiya Bihi, someone came to him and guided him towards the um, Safa Marwa. Uh, and in his dream, they showed him what to do. So when he went, he started digging. And as he started digging, this well, this sprung up and the, and the well of Zamzam was refound. So for hundreds of years, the Zamzam had disappeared. Yeah. So the Zamzam was the spring that meant people could come and live in Mecca. It was a place that was, um, could be, uh, you know, uh, it was habitable. And then after some events that unfolded, um, the, the, uh, um, the, the spring of Zamzam was lost. The spring of Zamzam was lost. And actually, even up to, if you look at some of the earliest photos of, um, of Mecca, some of the earliest that we have go back to 18, I've got, I've got some that go back to 1880, and you can get albums and you can probably get them online. There's some of the, early, there's earlier ones, I think that go, go back as, as far as the 1850s and 60s. Um, but there's a number that you can get from the 80, 1880, uh, um, and there's somebody called, I think his name is Sadiq Bey, Sadiq Bey, Bey um, one of the, uh, the Ottoman kind of photographers who, who really uh, um, did, you know, an immense, um, uh, alhamdulillah, like a, a great service in that he took these photos and we have these old ancient photos of the Kaaba and what it looked like. And it's really amazing because one of the things that you can see is you can see this beautiful construction, which is actually the well of Zamzam that you can see just outside there. The Kaaba. So you see the the main uh, um, the Kaaba itself, and then you see this uh, big construction, which is the well of Zamzam. And then outside of that, you then al around the Kaaba, you have these four tents, and each tent represents the different madhabs. Because one of the things that the Ottomans did was that they made sure, if, although it was primarily a Hanafi-run, uh, um, you know, uh, legal system. In, in the Haram Sharif, because there were so many different, uh, um, you know, nationalities that were all, well, they weren't really called nationalities then, but there were there were people coming from different countries who all uh, um, would meet in this one place that they made a point of having a tent for each of the madhab. So there is a Maliki tent, a Hanafi tent, a Shafi'i tent, and a Hanbali tent, where one could go and ask any questions of the Mufti, a Mufti of their, of their, of their madhab. So... These pictures are available, and it's really worth to, to kind of uh, get a get a sense of how uh, Mecca would have looked for you know hundreds of years because it didn't change drastically, other than some repair works that were done, which go as far back as uh, you know we have documented accounts of. Um, I mean, the earliest repair works happened it, it before the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as I as I mentioned uh, last week. But throughout history, there's been uh, occasions where it has to it had to be, uh, um, you know, repeated. And we have records of some of the uh, Uthmani uh, Khalifas, uh, Khulafa, the Ottoman Caliphs who write to the Sheikh al Islam, the, the 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 scholar that's seen as the kind of presiding uh, um, scholar for the state. Um, asking them for fatwas about how they should go about, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 kind of looking after the the house, um, and that. So this sense of reverence amongst the Ottomans has has been there for for centuries. In fact, in uh, in fifteen in fifteen seventeen, 
when uh, the the caliph at the time was the Abbasid caliph uh, al, al Mutawakkil. In the presence of Mutawakkil during the Jum'ah khutbah, the uh, the Imam got up and said, and he said he, he praised the the he said the um, he said the custodian of the of the two sanctuaries, yeah, the custodian of the two sanctuaries, the the wali, yeah, uh, wali al Um and it was a man that was sitting in the congregation that stood up, stood up and he said, he's not the wali al haramain he's the khadim al haramain He's not the custodian, he is the servant of the haramain And thereafter, that man was uh, Salim the first, Salim Ya'fuz, who, who was the kind of the fa founding father of the, uh, um, you know, you could say the one of the founding fathers of the um, Uthmanis. Um, he said, you're not the wali al Haramain, you're the Khadim al Haramain. And throughout history, thereafter, the Ottomans have always had this. They've referred to them, they refer to themselves as the Khadim al Haramain. I think the Wahhabis, when they came, they changed that again to, you know, Wilayat al Haramain and Wali al Haramain. But, and then I think it's made its way back again. But the point is, for hundreds of years, for about eight to 900 years, um, that's been the case where this idea that it was, we're, we're, not, we're not there to protect it, we're there to be uh, servants of the, of the Haramain. So this, uh, sense of reverence is always there. So, so the Khulafa, the, the Khalifa, would bow their heads. They, you know, they would submit to the authority of the of the Sheikh al-Islam when it came to these sorts of things. And there are uh, written accounts of the like Khalifa. I think it was Suleiman the Magnificent actually. Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, um, an, he he once wrote to his um, his uh, his uh, Sheikh al-Islam, and he said. What is the opinion on covering the Kaaba with gold? So he had this idea that if we're going to, the Kaaba is the centerpiece of the universe. And if we're going to decorate our masajid, if we're going to decorate our palaces, then the, the Kaaba is more deserving of it. So it came from a very noble place. He said, I want to decorate it with, a, with, with gold. To which his sheikh responded, he said, if God wanted to cover it in something special, he would have made it out of rubies. And Suleiman got the hint <laughs> and he decided he wasn't going to pursue it. But just because he had that inside him that he needed to sh show that sense of love and gratitude, he, he, he then put that money, he put that money into the, um, into other masajid. So he created the, you know, he, um, it was, uh, you know, he, he, um, he sanctioned uh, um, Sinan, Sinan to create the great blue mosque, the grand blue mosque in in, in uh, Turkey in Istanbul that we see today. It was the it was the construction of Sinan, the great architect of the Muslims, uh, um, you know that the Muslims always uh, um, kind of relied on for their for their building. Sinan also did some of the work on the on the on the Kaaba and the Haramain. In fact, the Haram Sharif uh, um, and some of the architecture. I, I don't know if it's still there or it's been um, a lot of it has been destroyed with time, and the Wahhabis did a number on it too. Um, but he was one of the greatest art architects that you know of, of the of the, amongst the Muslims, and he was uh, the architect of the of the elite. Um, so it was uh, he was he was tasked to go and build the the blue mosque. Um, so that money and that that effort and that desire went into you know God's house rather than to their own uh, you know kind of for their own for their own needs. Um, anyway. So going back to the, the, the topic in hand, um, that tangent was really for you to go and investigate and have a look at some of those old photos. There's some amazing, amazing pictures that you'll see of how it used to look. And it wouldn't have been much different if you go back a few hundred years, um, just because it was really industrialization uh, has, uh, and the sh sheer number of people that can get there so quickly now. Um, you know, you can see in those old photos, people are going on camels, and there's even a place where people just tie their camels. So there are photos of hundreds and hundreds of camels all lined up outside where people have parked their camels and gone in. Uh, and of course, now you, you, we go on planes, so people can go three, four, five times, do round trips very easily without a second thought. People who take, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, uh, groups to Amran go, you know, eight, nine, ten times a year in some cases. So they, it's, it's a very frequent. Now, if, if thousands of people are doing that every year, then the numbers are huge. And... You know, it's not, you know, we hear stories. I mean, I, I remember hearing stories from my, um, you know, my parents about how the haram used to be empty when, when they were younger. Actually, if you look at the old photos, they weren't. They used to be empty most of the year, but the Jum'ah was absolutely packed. 
Like the Jum'a in that haram, although it's been expanded quite a bit, but it was completely packed. Um, the other thing that they had in those days was that they didn't have the drainage system that we have today, which is that they could fulfill this sunnah of even some of the, uh, um, I believe, I think there's an account of even some of the Sahaba doing this. Allahu Alam, maybe I'm kind of misremembering, but where the rains would come down really heavily and then the, the haram, because it's a valley, it would be full, which meant that the, the, they would swim around it. So completing the tawaf, swimming around it was something that has historically has been done many, many times over. And there are photos of that. And we, see we, we, we don't have that anymore because of the drainage system. It's brought many benefits too, of course. Um, it means that the Kaaba doesn't have to be constantly uh, 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 fixed. Um, so anyway, that was an encouragement for you to go and inshallah look at those photos if you haven't already done so. Um, and the other reason I mentioned it, it was just how the 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 elite, the the leaders, the Muslim leaders would submit to the fatwa of the of the shuyukh, and they would ask you know questions like, is it permissible for us to repair the Kaaba? And there was a, there is a fatwa where somebody, one of the uh, Khalifas of the Ottomans, asked the Sheikh al Islam what the what their opinion is on on um, fixing any damaged uh, brickwork. And the answer that the Sheikh, Sheikh gave was, he says, it's permissible because our job is to serve and look after the, the, um, the Kaaba. So for future generations, he said, but one should, all, but one should use the, the, the natural rocks that are available in and around Mecca. So try and source the, the, the rocks locally from Mecca. Um, so going back to Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib saw this dream of the 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 um, the uh, um, Zamzam, um, and he he went and he opened he dug it up and he and he refound the spring that had gone had gotten lost. Why what happened? Skipping back a few weeks ago, we talked about Sayyidina Ismail and the and the Jurhum. The Jurhum, they originated from Yemen. They originated from Yemen. They came to the Hijaz and had been living there for a while, in and around the Hijaz. Yeah. But they were, they were not living in Mecca. It was only when the Jurhum came across Sayyidina Ismail and Hajar and saw this spring that they realized that this is a place that they can settle and find, find a home. Why were they there? They were there. Um, in fact, let I'm not going to even go into 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 that story because that will take some time, and I'm conscious that I only get, get an hour, so I'll try and stick to the point. Now, Ismail Alayhislam married into the Jurham. I've already talked about this. Um, when Sayyidina Ismail passed away, it was his son. Ismail was then the custodian after his father, the custodian of the Kaaba. He was the one who looked after the Kaaba uh, Sharif. When he passed away, one of his sons, uh, his name was Nabit ibn Ismail. Nabit ibn Ismail. Nabit ibn Ismail then took over the custodianship, looking after and serving the Kaaba. Yeah. Um, after Nabit, after Nabit passed away, at this point, it was the Jurhum, because Ismail was. Partly through from the Jurhum because of his bloodline through Jurhum, yeah, from his uh, from his uh, um, mother's side. Um, so he he was uh, um, uh, sorry, Nabit was a big fan. Nabit was uh, partly through from his mother's side, from from his from his father's side. However, he wasn't through Sayyidina Ismail. So when Nabit took over, he represented both the Jurhum. And his father's, uh, uh, you know, lineage. After Nabi passed away, it was then given to somebody from the Jurhum. The the leadership, the custodianship, was given to somebody from the Jurhum because it was seen as that. Then that person represents the Jurhum now. Yeah. So he was at this point. This is second generation now. That that assimilation already happened. Sayyidina Ismail had already been brought up, so there wasn't necessarily a differentiation between who was Jurhumi and who was you know, from, from, from Sayyidina Ismail, that didn't necessarily happen as sharply as, you know, so, so it's probably quite natural and it was a, probably a, an agreement that would, that's what would happen, that the first instance it would be given through to Sayyidina Ismail and then, and, and then the, the second uh, transfer 
would be an open kind of democratic, it could be somebody from pure Durham, it could be somebody from the uh, the, the tribe of, uh, it's the combination of Sayyidina Ismail and the, and the, the Durham. Now, after Nabit, it was somebody else said from the Durham, this man that took over this leadership was uh, Mu uh, sorry, Mudad ibn Amr al-Jurhumi. His name was Mudad ibn Amr al-Jurhumi. Mudad ibn Amr al-Jurhumi. So who were the inhabitants at the time? The inhabitants of Mecca at this point then, just to get, just to, just so we get a sense of, uh, we get a bit of perspective here as to what's happening. We're now in the second generation, going on to the third generation, after the passing away of Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salam. After the passing of Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salam. At this point, who's in Mecca? It's a very new city in that no, the, the Zamzam had only recently been you know, found with the, with say that by Sayyidina Hajar. Um, so it was a very new city and people had only started inhabiting it uh, um, you know, over the last you know, hundred odd years, if, if not less than that. Who were they? They were the children of Ismail with inhabitants, number one. His grandchildren were the inhabitants. Sayyidina Ismail's grandchildren were there. You had his maternal uncles through the through the Jurhum. Yeah, and, all, and, and also his his own, uh, um, you know, from his paternal. So he had the the uncles of Sayyidina Ismail who then and their lines, meaning their children and so on, and the grandchildren, so the cousins. Um, you had then alongside them, you had two tribes, yeah, two pure tribes. Both of these hailed from Yemen. Both of these were Arab tribes that hailed from Yemen. The first tribe was, of course, the Jurhum, yeah, the first, as in the Jurhum originated from Yemen, yeah. The first tribe who had not, meaning they didn't have the, um, uh, they were not from the children of Sayyidina Ismail, so therefore they were pure Jurhumi. So that first tribe, uh, um, was the Jurhum and the second tribe was the Qatura, Qatura, in fact, the Qatura, yeah. two tribes, the Jurhum and the Qatura, two tribes. So yeah, so that's the inhabitants of, in, in Mecca at the time. How did they end up there? The Jurhum and the uh, and the Qatura, um, they end up the, the pure uh, kind of uh, Jurhum and Qatura who were uh, who were uh, who came to um, who arrived in Mecca after the time of Sayyidina Ismail after Ismail yeah uh, they were they arrived there because the two tribes these two groups were thrown out they were thrown out of uh, of Yemen so something had happened there. Uh, and they were there were accusations made, and they were chucked out. And what I mean by that is, any there was a, it was standard practice in those days that exile was the solution to any form of oppression. And we'll see shortly, inshallah, that this happened again. So where any accusations are made of oppression of these these leaders, and if that was confirmed or if it was felt that that was uh, happening, then the punishment was exile. So you'd be banished from your land. So these two. Uh, uh, tribes ended up here. The two tribes were actually from two cousins. Yeah, two cousins. The first was Mudad. Mudad was the head of, he was the leader of the Jurhum. So Mudad, that was the first. And the second one who became the head of the Qatura or uh, the Qutay, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the Qatura uh, was, was uh, um, Sumayda. Sumayda. So you had these two cousins, um, Qutayra. Uh, no, Sumaida, beg your pardon, Sumaida and Mudad, Mudad ibn Amr, um, and then you had Sumaida, Sumaida with the scene. So what they were known for, both of these, they were quite competitive. These two, these two cousins were very competitive, uh, and their and their tribes were like this. So they were both known that whenever they'd leave their land, whenever they left. Uh, the, the Yemen and actually reading uh, Ibn Hisham actually he, he doesn't say that they were necessarily uh, um, that they were that they were um, that they were banished from uh, from Yemen it just said he just says that they left Yemen but he does say this that whenever they left their land whenever they left their homeland they were known that they, wherever they ended up they would have some sort of leadership role within it 
So very competitive. Wherever they end up, they take some sort of leadership role. So when they arrived in Mecca and they saw that there was a water source there, there was inhabitants there, and they, they decided they were going to settle there. Yeah. Mudad was the head of the Jurhumis. Um, and because these two were competitive, they both agreed that, look, we're going to respect each other's territory. So Mudad ended up f at the top of, at the top of uh, Mecca. And, uh, uh, and, um, um, and uh, um, Sumaida ended up at the bottom end of Mecca. So they both kind of took two different ends of, of Mecca. And they agreed that they won't encroach on either, each other's territory. That was, uh, um, you know, so in that way they can both lead. And the leadership role they wanted to take was whenever visitors came to Mecca through there, then that each of them would host them. If they were from the top, if they came in from the top of Mecca, they'd be hosted by the Jurhum. And if they came through into the bottom, then it'd be, it'd be, uh, they'd be hosted by the, uh, um, the Qatura. So these two tribes had this understanding that they would both split these duties. They would each host and live in these separate parts and they would not encroach on one another. What happened was that they they ended up some some sort of rebellion kicked off, and they both accused each other. One said that it was your tribe that started it. The other said that the other tribe started it, and eventually it led to these two factions. Two factions. On the one hand, you had the uh, the Qatura, the tribe of Qatura, and any other alliances that they may have, may have had. But on the other hand. You had the 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 Jurhum, but then you also had the Banu Ismail, who you had all the children of Sayyidina Ismail who had a stake in the Jurhum, and then specifically through his son Nabit, you had his the 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 the, uh, the children of Nabit, yeah, the children of Nabit. Um, so you had these two, the broader tribe of Banu Ismail. You had then the specific tribe of Banu uh, Banu uh, Nabit, who the, the son of Ismail. And then on top of that, you had the you had Mudad and the Jurhum. Yeah, Mudad, the leader of the Jurhum and the Jurhumis. So all of them collectively against the uh, Qatura. And of course, the Qatura didn't stand a chance. And because they were, uh, they were acute, they were, um, it, it was said that they started this rebellion. They were uh, um, exiled from Mecca. So that was the end of them. So when they were, uh, um, when they were exiled, um, uh, Sumaida was killed. Yeah, Sumaida, the head of them, was killed. Um, the yeah, so the, the and the Qatura, they were so the those who fought were exiled. Those who were just amongst their tribe were given the chance to just submit and accept the authority of of the the, the Jurhumis, and they they did. And they submitted to it, and they came under a, a, a agreement of uh, to be protected, or, or protection was given to them. And then, so you, so there were people that had to be exiled. Their their leader Sumay that was killed, and then there were some that remained, and they were uh, taken under the wing of the Jurhumis, and they were accepted as uh, uh, having had no uh, direct part in it, and and that was. Uh, said. Now Ibn Hisham says He says this is the first Account of a rebellion In the Haram It wasn't the last It wasn't the last So the, the children of Ismail uh, uh, then he, they, they spread far and wide Beyond the Hijaz so As time went on he's, you know, His uh, children uh, um, Had children and they had children And it kind of the, the tribe began to grow And they moved out of Hijaz And of course now we're, we're all over the world um, and the the and the custodianship, as I said earlier, was at this point before before they started moving. At this point, after Nabit was Mudad, Mudad being the Jurhami, yeah. Um, so as they as the 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 children of Ismail and the grandchildren, the, they started spreading far and wide. The Jurhumis became more and more protective over what they believed was theirs. Yeah, um, kind of a very militant attitude to um, to anyone that was an outsider or anyone that threatened what they thought belonged to them. To the point that they became very oppressive. Um, they began to eat from the wealth of the Kaaba because people were coming there as a, as a pilgrimage, as a place of respect, and it was where 
trade was beginning to start. You had, uh, um, you know, the, these, um, um, you know, there was a lot of wealth that had been had started growing in, in, in you know, for the in the Kaaba. The Jurhum started eating from that wealth and enjoying it. Yeah. So people would gift it, and the Jurhum would take it. So the Banu Bakr, so the Banu Bakr, uh, um, who um, who were from the Banu Kinana. So this is now where the link comes into the Prophet Yeah. The Banu Kinana, I mentioned this last week. The Banu Kinana was the broad tribe, yeah, um, the, through which the Banu Hashim come. Yeah, the Banu Kinana is through whom you find the Banu Hashim, and the Banu Hashim, of course, is there. The Prophet uh, uh, tribe. So the Banu Bakr were a tribe, a sub tribe of the Kinana. So the Banu Kinana. There was another tribe also known as the Banu Khaza'a. The Banu Khaza'a. Both the Banu Bakr, who were from the Kinana, and the Banu Khaza'a, seeing that this was happening, right? Because look, these now, who are the Banu Khaza and Banu Kinana? They, they're coming they, because as time's moving on, the children of Ismail are you know, moving around. The, 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 the ancestors of the Prophet have been born, yeah? And we are, and say, you know, the Kinana, the great 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 grandfather of the Prophet has been born and the tribe has been formed, yeah? The Jurahumis are still, have got custodianship of the Kaaba. And it was in the time of the Banu Kinana that the Banu Bakr, who are one of the sub-tribes, and the Banu Khuza'a, which is another tribe altogether, that they decided enough is enough. Seeing that this is happening where people are being attacked, killed, exiled, all because they were standing up to this oppression, um, they decided that we, we've got to join forces and we've got to do something about the Jurhum. And the only thing that you could do was exile, because if you were if you were um, held you know, if you were held guilty of rebellion, sorry, of uh, of injustice, then the punishment for that was exile. Yeah, and that's what happened. In um, th they used to call it a nasa, a nasa. Yeah, which is the punishment for uh, for uh, this injustice in the time of Jahili. That's what they called it. They decided that they were going to. So they fought, and in that fight, the Jurhum didn't stand a chance. Uh, and they they fled. At this at this point, who was the custodian? At this point, the person who had been leading from the Jurahum was the great grandson of Mudad. So Mudad had passed away, uh, and um, you know he and then his son who had taken over passed away, and then his son, and I think it was the son after that it was the it was the third son, um, who at this point had custodianship, and it was under his watch that the Jurahum had become this uh, oppressive regime. And it was in and, they, and it was at that point that the Banu Kinana or the Banu Bakr and the Banu Khuzama, uh, Khuzaa, sorry, had them uh, exiled, but they didn't leave without a mark, because what he did was what the great grandson of uh, Mudad did was he he took the rukan of the Kaaba and he took some of the the cloth and 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 he and he he buried it and he buried the he buried the um the zamzam. Yeah, so he decided he went to the source of Zamzam and he and he covered it up. Um, and they say that um, Makkah, one of the names of Makkah was Bakka. Yeah, it's called Bakka. And they say it was called Bakka because of this uh, this uh, this thing that they used to do, which is whenever there was injustice, they would they would you know cut off the head of injustice, i.e. that exile them, and that's why it's known as Bakka, meaning they would you know they would uh, remove the um, Bakka means to kind of um, to divide or to sever. Um, so what they, what, they, what they did was they, they would remove the oppression. So it's said that that was one of the reasons why Makkah used to be known as Bakkah uh, um, because of this, uh, this thing that they had, um, that they used to do. When that happened and the Jurhum now were gone and the, um, and the, uh, uh, the Jurhum is gone now, the well of Zamzam is now, has now been buried. Yeah, the well of Zamzam has been buried. The water is still there probably because the water hasn't flowed because it's a question, why, why would the people not just 
uh, refined it. It wasn't as easy as that because people didn't necessarily at this point. There's it's been a few you know some years after Sayyidina Ismail, so the source of a well, the source of water is not the same as the kind of where the water eventually flows. Um, so for whatever reason, this had had gone and people just carried on. Uh, until eventually this need arose, but people had, by that point people forgot that the, the the well even existed. It was just became a um, they say that it became a folklore. The people mentioned there used to be a well, but who believed it? Um, because it, you know Mecca was a dry land, um, and it was you wouldn't expect there to be a well with such a, such a rich source of water. So people began to think it was just a just a um, uh, kind of a, a, a folklore. After the Jurahum were cast out, they were they were removed from Mecca. It was the Khuza'a, the Banu Khuza'a, so not the Banu Bakr from the Kinana, it was Banu Khuza'a that then took custody. It was agreed that they would take the uh, custody of the of the Kaaba Sharif. And that's what they did. They kept custody, and as time went on, one leader passed to another leader until it got to somebody called Hulayl. Al Ibn Al Ibn Habashiya Al Khuzai. When it got to Hulayl Ibn Habashiya Al Khuzai, it was in his time that we have uh, um, we have the father of Abdul Muttalib, yeah, um, the father of Abdul Abdul Muttalib. Um, we have Qusay, yeah, we have Qusay, uh, who 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 lives, who, who was a contemporary. Hulayl ibn Habashiya al-Khuzai is now the custodian of the Kaaba. Qusay then goes to him and asks for the hand of his daughter. He asks for, Qusay is from the Banu Kinana. There is mutual respect for how the Hulayl and the Khuzai came into power. So the Banu Kinana still had a lot of clout. They had a lot of clout because they were, had this agreement that the Khuza'a would be technically be the custodians, but actually it would be a joint uh, custodianship, although they would have that uh, kind of technically they'd be known as the, uh, to, to have that role. Qusay asked for the hand of Hulayl's daughter. Her name was Hubba. Her name was Hubba. And of course, Hulayl accepted. Hulayl accepted. And through Hubba, Qusay had uh, four children. He had Abd Dar, Abd Dar. So ignore what I said about Abd Muttalib. I was tracking back. He had Abd uh, um, Abd Dar. So Qusay had these four children. Abd Dar. He had Abd Manaf, Abd Al Uzza, and Abd. These four children through Qusay. The, through Hubba, sorry, Qusay had four children. They were Abd Dar, or four boys, Abd Manaf, Abd Al Uzza, and Abd. And as it so happened, uh, the children of Qusay prospered in that they all had children, they all had boys. Um, Hulayl didn't, and very soon afterwards, Hulayl's lineage kind of came to a, a, a natural end. And it was through, and that left then Qusay, who um, who who saw that uh, um, you know he you know quite old at this point, he thought that they it was only right that Hulay not having anybody that could that could um, you know that could take take his um, take the role, um, as in no direct son that could be the custodian. Qusay saw it that it would be the only fit thing to do, the only right thing to do is that the custodianship be handed over to the Banu Kinana. So all those years ago, when the Banu Kinana accepted that the Khuza'a should have the custodianship, now, because that was the right thing to do, now Qusay felt that it was the right thing to do, given that Qusay had, you know, number of male children and there was a way of, you know, they could, they, this could live on. Qusay uh, wanted the uh, leadership uh, or the the he wanted that the that he was his children or he would take over the custodianship of the of the uh, of the Kaaba and then Abd Manaf he's he would have 
Hashim, and then through Hashim, we have the Banu Hashim, and then you have Abdul Muttalib, and then through Abdul Muttalib, you have Abdullah, and then of course you have the Prophet. Now, this, there's a lot of detail I've put into that. I put a lot, there's a fair amount of detail, and, and I've mentioned it because I like to think, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think if I do this, you know, if I go through the seerah, that I try and fill in as many blanks as possible and try and, you know, create a, as much of a, a familiarity with it as possible. That's the intention. For some people, it's a lot of detail. For others, they, they, they are detail orientated. The, 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 the classes are recorded. They are on YouTube for now. Um, so do, you know, listen to them and write these things down because I do treat this like a, like more of a class than a lecture. I'd like to do that because um, it means hopefully a bit of both. Um, but I don't want to sacrifice too much detail for the sake of it being a lecture, um, you know, and treat it like a lecture. But equally, I don't want to go into so much detail that I lose people's uh, kind of focus and interest. So there was a number of people that I've mentioned because I think they are very important, important and it does kind of tie tie back the story to Sayyidina Ismail and you can see how the Jurhum came because early on I was getting these questions and I'm kind of hopefully this is starting to be pieced together now how Makkah came about, how they were, who the tribes were and some of the lineages. I'm trying not to repeat what I mentioned last week. There are a few things that are, uh, I, I, the lineage is there. I mentioned it last week, listen to it on YouTube or uh, you know, you've um, if you've got the notes, go through it and you'll see how this all uh, links up. Because at this stage, where are we? We're, we're, we're about, you know, in the, with, with Qusay, we're still, we're about 100 years or so before the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, I think it's about 100 years, maybe. We, we don't really know the ages uh, of, of each of the forefathers. We have guesstimates and some numbers, but... Um, you know, we've moved away from the time of Sayyidina Ismail now. We've moved a few generations on. And we're much more closer to the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu now, so uh, at this stage. So I want to stop there because there's then, I, I started with the dream of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. And then I tracked back and I have given you the, the backstory, which is how it, uh, the, 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 the um, Zamzam went missing. And I've stopped at uh, Qusayi. Uh, um, and he's, you know, him having the custodianship, and the and Abd Manaf, he's uh, he's uh, his son. And I mentioned he had four sons through Hubba, his wife, and Hubba was through the Khuzaa, and that's where the Khuzaa meets the uh, Banu Kinana, um, with, with the lineage of some meets. And, and what you should have in the back of your mind also is all of these various tribes, how they come together. When the Prophet ﷺ said that I was chosen from the the, the, the best of the best of the best. This is what you should have in mind because these are some of the great tribes of the Jurhum, of the, of course, the, you know, the Ad Adnani uh, um, you know, Arabs, so from Say Sayyidina um, Ismail uh, uh, -salam, and, and all that history of the, of the prophets. Um, you have the Banu Kinana, you have the Banu Hashim. Each of these have a, have a, have a significant role in the development of, um, of this, um, this great history of of Makkah, even pre, you know, pre-Islam, and there's details that I've missed because there are, uh, um, which maybe inshallah on an, another occasion I'll, I will I will fill. But for now, I think it's sufficient. I think the amount of detail I've given you is, um, I think, uh, sufficient. Um, we'll stop there, inshallah. I shall see you all hopefully in a couple of days. Tomorrow you have a Sheikh Sajjad's lesson, and then um, you've got me again on Wednesday. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi.